thank you for joining us to talk about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on food and housing insecurity. We're hoping this workshop will give you some information about how our communities are being impacted by the COVID-19 crisis and how they're responding to this. Um, and we're hoping that we'll lay the groundwork for you all to talk about these issues with your members of Congress. I'm Julie Bodner. I'm a policy advisor in the Office of Domestic Social Development at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And we are joined today by two experts in the field who can help you understand what's really going on on the ground and give us some hope by sharing some of the good work that's being done around the country and name some of the real challenges where we need policymakers to step in. So both of our speakers work for Catholic Charities USA, the national office for the 167 different Catholic Charities member agencies around the country. Jane Stenson is the Vice President for Food and Nutri Nutrition and Poverty Reduction Strategies for Catholic Charities USA. She leads the organization's strategic priority on food and nutrition and supports agencies as they ident identify and implement best practices and program areas like poverty reduction, asset development, and accreditation. Curtis Johnson is the Vice President of Housing Strategy for Catholic Charities USA. He helps Catholic Charities and related housing providers nationwide and preserve to preserve expand, and expand affordable housing stock. He's working in the affordable housing space and has been there for over three decades, um, working with housing authorities, state and local governments, community development corporations, and the Diocese of Camden. Um, you can read their full bios on the CVET site, and I encourage you to do so, but trust me when I say that we're lucky to have them here to share their expertise and insights. I'm gonna start out just laying some groundwork um, as you all know, as we all know, this nation is struggling right now. We're in an unprecedented health and economic crisis, and it's having a real impact on people. So I want to show you just a few slides to help set the stage for our conversation. People are still struggling to find and maintain employment. While the number of jobs, while the number of people losing jobs every week is less now than at the start of the pandemic, they're still too high and we haven't recovered the jobs we've already lost. So the number of people who have been out of work long-term continues to rise. And not everyone is impacted equally. Those in low wage jobs are not seeing the same improvements in the economy. And this has real consequences on people's lives, right? Too many people can't afford to put food on the table and they can't afford to pay their rent and their mortgage. And again, this is not impacting everyone equally. Individuals and families of color are bearing the brunt of this economic downturn. The pandemic is exacerbating the inequalities that are already present in our society. Those who are most in need and have been systemically disadvantaged are being hit the hardest. Congress has been doing important work to respond to these needs. And here are just some of the important measures that have been included in recent COVID-19 relief legislation. And all of this will be a lifeline to families in need, but more is needed. And that's the message that we want you to carry to Congress during CSMG. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about our network's work on food related services during the pandemic. It's been quite a ride. Um, I work nationally, so I don't, I'm not active in direct food distribution or running those programs, but my role is to support our agencies around the country on issues related to food and nutrition. Uh, our network serves in a typical year about 9 million people in food-related services. So it's by far our biggest service um, in terms of direct touch with individuals and families. Um, so many people coming to Catholic Charities who might ultimately really need housing services or need childcare also are food insecure. So we are involved in a variety of food programs. We certainly run food pantries and in some instances, food banks, which are very large operations. We run a lot of senior center, childcare, Head Start, after school programs where we feed groups of, groups of children or seniors. So congregate dining. A lot of our agencies also run um, lunch programs for indigent in the community where they can come in and get a hot meal and maybe connected to other services. 
and also summer, summer feeding sites in the summer when kids are out of school and after school, as well as Meals on Wheels and other in-home delivery. Um, COVID just <laughs> disrupted all of this as it did so many of our lives. Um, over the course of the last nine to 10 months, um, we are estimating, we don't have really hard data, but from everything we were getting from the network, we've already doubled the number of individuals that we've provided food support to. So we're estimating the network of Catholic Charities agencies is serving about 18 million. Um, it took you know, some agencies a little bit of time to immediately transition. Um, as you can imagine, some programs it was very difficult to do virtually. Others had to continue like residential programs. Um, but very quickly, agencies transitioned a lot of their food distribution to grab and go. Um, I will say we immediately lost most of our volunteers, so it put a lot of burden on staff. Uh, a lot of staff were pulled from other programs to really augment the work and make sure people were able to access food. Um, if you're running a residential program, you have responsibility to feed your residents, make sure they have a meal three times a day. So staff was very active in maybe distributing food, making sure um, congregate meal sites were closed. So delivering door to door in some of our residential programs, a lot of um, shelter clients were moved into motels just for their own personal safety. A lot of these motel rooms did not have kitchenettes. So this required staff to deliver meals daily. So it was um, quite, a, um, quite a burden for staff. And in those early days, it was very difficult to access PPE. We talk about it now as though it's ancient history, but April does seem like a long time ago with everything that's happened. So many of our staff were out there doing this work with very limited protection. Um, we've been able to address that certainly over the last few months. Um, we saw a lot of agencies really use their relationships and work beautifully with parishes. Um, I know a lot of the food distribution is done at the parish level. So um, a lot of our agencies partnered with parishes trying to ensure that they had sufficient food what we saw when the whole production line was disrupted, um, you know, going into stores, there was very little on the shelf. The same was true with agencies. Um, our main supply of food is through food banks. Food banks suddenly were faced with this tremendous increase in demand. And so a lot of what agencies were requesting, were, they were unable to get. So we were really seeing um, less product on the shelves of our food pantries, yet demand was going up dramatically. Um, we tried to support that. Um, we secured some national donations. Uh, we were able to work with a dairy cooperative out of Wisconsin, who put us in touch with a lot of dairy farmers across the country. Uh, when they were dumping milk, often I was getting calls from farmers um, asking if we would be interested in donated milk products. That was everything from liquid milk to yogurt and cheese and sour cream, things like that. Um, so we were taking what we could, uh, moving it across the country uh, to try to augment um, the local needs. Also agencies, um, we were seeing some really um, interesting um, local partnerships. Some agencies were able to divert their food budgets to work with local restaurants. I thought this was really creative and, and just something I hope we can continue to do. Um, this allowed restaurants to keep their employees paid. They were preparing the meals and in many instances were also helping Catholic charity staff deliver the meals unit to unit. Um, nationally, we secured donations from Latter-day Saint, the Mormon church. They were incredibly generous and distributed really semi-full, semis uh, to many of our agencies full of dry goods. 
So um, at least got them through a two week hump during the early days of this. Um, com- companies started to reach out. We were hearing from a lot of restaurant supply companies that could no longer move their product locally and were looking for outlets for donations. Um, We did, um, through our fundraising efforts, were able to secure um, sufficient funds that we could directly purchase food, which is something we don't typically do. Food purchasing is always brokered locally. Catholic Charities USA does not have a food budget. We don't, agencies don't look to us to help with their food purchasing. Because things were so dire, we did step in and were able to purchase for about 60 of our food, larger food pantries across the country, a two week supply of dry goods. Um, We were also incredibly fortunate. I mean, really, I I just have to say, um, some of the donations were unexpected, but just critical. And one of those was trucking. (laughs) Uh, We, as I said, we typically um, don't purchase food. We don't have a fleet of trucks. Um, That can be a tremendous barrier to accepting donations. Most uh, donors want to have one organization that accepts the product, and then it's up to us to push it out. So we did receive a large trucking donation, which really facilitated uh, national distribution of a lot of these products. One of the other things our agencies did, we've been very active in benefits enrollments for a number of years. Uh, Many individuals come to Catholic Charities and might not be um, aware that they qualify for public benefits or have let those lapse, um, not gotten recertified. So a lot of the work of frontline staff um, through intake and assessment is determining if individuals and families would qualify So um, SNAP is just such an incredible lifeline, which SNAP is also the food bank, the food stamp program changed its name a couple years ago, but was, um, it was really critical for agencies to continue their outreach on SNAP and enrollment activities, changing that from face-to-face to virtual. So we saw a significant increase in the number of households we were able to enroll in SNAP. And SNAP coupled with um, accessing a food pantry really would help families and individuals kind of maintain a monthly food budget that allowed them to really decrease significantly some of their food insecurity. You may have heard of the Farmers to Families Food Program. It was a new initiative of USDA. It was launched around April. It was a wonderful program and concept where USDA was purchasing supplies from farmers across the country. These included dairy, fruits and vegetables, and then later protein and really help farmers kind of sustain (laughs) their farms um, because of that backlog in the food distribution network and get these needed critical products to families in need. Um, Catholic Charities USA worked with this program. The program was authorized in different two month segments. It was challenging. There were a lot of different vendors So our role was really just to help agencies connect with the approved vendors. Um, It's a great box of food. (laughs) It contains, it's about a 20 pound box of fruits and vegetables, dairy and protein. It's a wonderful box of food. It's it's just a challenging program to work with. Um, We discovered that many of our agencies didn't have adequate refrigeration or storage capacity to really be able to fully participate in this program. Um, We did work with our agency in San Antonio um, on an effort where they accepted product for the entire state for the 12 Catholic Charities agencies across Texas. And then we used our donated trucking to move that product from San Antonio down to Rio Grande Valley and Beaumont and Dallas and Fort Worth. So it was a wonderful way where we could really capitalize on the fact that one agency in Texas had sufficient refrigeration and capacity to accept that 
And then we could send the product out in smaller chunks to the agencies across the state. Unfortunately, um, that could not happen everywhere, but um, we did try to step in where we felt that we could make a difference. Um, again, uh, some amazing aspects about the program. It was just reauthorized and will um, launch again, probably the end of January, early February through April. It's a nice program in that it's just grab and go. You put the box of food in someone's truck. You don't have to ask a lot of questions. It's, however, it can be very challenging in that all of these products need to be refrigerated. And I'm sure this audience knows not many local parish uh, food pantries can accept a truckload of refrigerated goods. We just don't have that kind of capacity. Um, Public policy-wise, I really want to commend my colleagues in our social policy department. Kim Mazik is my point within our policy department on food-related issues. And we did a lot of work with USDA, um, keeping them informed about the impact of COVID on our network, particularly around nutrition programs. Um, and then also really tried to keep our frontline staff very well informed as to what was happening federally. There were a lot of waivers to federal nutrition programs um, because things had to go virtual that really helped to eliminate barriers for individuals applying for public benefits, particularly in the nutrition space. Um, SNAP has always been a benefit where you take your EBT card and go, go to the grocery store and use that card like a Visa card. There had been a very small demonstration of about four states prior to COVID where USDA was experimenting with families on SNAP using their EBT card to do online purchasing. Because of the need to keep people socially distanced and keep them safe, USDA waived that and expanded that demonstration to, I believe now, 49 states. So the ability for individuals, whether they're a homebound senior, um, a rural family living in Montana that would have to travel great distances to get to a store, can now order online. Um, they do have to pay the um, shipping costs, but they can use their SNAP benefit to order online. There were also a lot of other waivers that we hope will be able to be continued and supported, if not through the life of COVID or through the end of 2021, but also potentially could be looked at as being permanent waivers and just be part of that program design. Um, I also want to speak to, I know I'm getting close to my time, uh, there's been significant expansion to some of the nutrition programs in the current stimulus package and also in the Biden proposal for the stimulus package to SNAP has been increased by 15%, the basic benefit. So that is just a, a tremendous need right now to um, give people additional purchasing power for food. It lessens the burden on local food pantries to keep their shelves sufficiently stocked, which continues to be a challenge and really gives the consumer more direct purchasing power by increasing their benefits so that they can go into the grocery store and get what they know they need. So I would encourage you to speak to that and how important that is um, uh, on your Hill visits. That would be tremendous. Also, some of the waivers, I have these um, links here for you. There, there were a number of them, um, but just even waiving the face-to-face -face requirement for uh, families applying for SNAP, applying for WIC, they could now do that virtually, you know, signatures being waived, um, extending the period of recertification so families didn't inadvertently um, lose their benefit because they forgot the deadline to recertify. So there were a lot of um, 
things that USDA is now allowing that really made access to these critical public benefits uh, a little easier during this time of tremendous crisis. So I will stop there. Um, uh, I also want to kind of tee it up for my colleague, Curtis. Um, I, I just want to say food is so linked to housing. Um, we always encourage people if they're facing a really, really tight budget and maybe eviction is looming or they've really um, lost sufficient hours of, you know, in their own paycheck or a spouse is no longer employed and it's getting increasingly difficult to pay that rent or pay that mortgage to utilize the services of a food pantry if that helps free up money to pay the rent. So I think that link between food and housing is just really critical to emphasize and supporting people through some of these public nutrition programs also gives them more um, flex in their budget to really secure their housing, which is just absolutely critical to keeping a family intact and healthy. So with that, I turn it over to my colleague, Curtis Johnson. Thank you very much, Jane, for teeing that up. And uh, Julie, you can go through the next two slides real quick and yeah, keep going. And I just want to uh, thank Jane for that. Uh, you know, she's been a tremendous colleague as of all of mine at uh, Catholic Charities USA. And thanks to uh, Julie Bonner and uh, Kim Mazik for uh, asking me to uh, be a part of this. Um, I always love the social ministry gathering is such a big uh, uh, component of affordable housing. And I just start off with this uh, slide from uh, a quote by uh, Pope Francis from 2015, just to point out to you that affordable housing has been in crisis long before the pandemic, even long before this 2015 uh, quote, but I, I thought it would make the uh, case even a little stronger. Next slide, please. So as you can see, just a few key data points I want to share with you um, about the uh, affordable housing crisis pre-pandemic. Uh, point out to you uh, a couple of key things. In 2016, uh, we were estimating that uh, evictions were occurring in the country at a rate of one every seven minutes. That just underscores the lack of affordable housing and availability. And also, uh, you should know that since 2010, I thought this was astounding, that rent prices have continued to rise, increasing 150%. Of course, this has led to increased homelessness and related financial and health problems. And as Jane talked about, nutrition that you know that leads right to health. That that comes with housing and security. Next slide. So, just as a backdrop, even our own CCUSA survey data of our network proved the uh, pan, uh, the housing crisis pre-pandemic. So I'll give you an example, in our 29, 2019 survey data, we uh, reported 37,000 plus uh, uh, units of affordable housing collectively, and also 1,500 of units in production in a production pipeline that year. The sobering fact was that we also reported 53, over 53,000 unduplicated applicants on our member network's wait list. What's that mean? That means if we doubled our unit portfolio and added another 37,000 units, we'd still have a 16,000 unit shortfall. That's uh, really incredible. Next slide. So today I wanna to talk to you about three specific areas in affordable housing where COVID impacted uh, the work of the members of the uh, CCUSA Housing Community of Practice. And those areas are homeless prevention, property management, and real estate development. Next slide. So let's talk about homeless prevention for a bit. So in that, in that space, member agencies and housing corporations work with house counseling, case management, and rental assistance is one of the key uh, 
ways to forestall homelessness. So even in things working around foreclosure and, and eviction prevention through counseling and case management, certainly emergency rental assistance payment has long been a uh, regular staple of uh, Catholic Charities agencies and one that has really made it to the end of a fiscal year, even in the best of times because of so much demand and house insecurity. Uh, case managers and counselors educate uh, clients about the moratoriums and what they mean, uh, landlord negotiations, foreclosure counseling, et cetera. Next slide. Just to give you the, so put in some context, so our member agency in Atlanta just talked about the incredible increased intense demand for rental assistance because of COVID, but the lack of sufficient resources to meet that demand. And you'll see on the out of uh, office message there that uh, you know reflects this to those that were late to getting their applications and or just ran out of assistance. Even then our member agencies try to refer uh, our clients to other places to try to find this assistance. Next slide. And just to show you, we're going to go from Atlanta to Hawaii. And even in the land of paradise, um, you can see there was a, a message on their website that they ran out of uh, uh, assistance for uh, uh, funding for rental assistance. And this was unique because uh, Catholic Charities of Hawaii uh, received $43 million in CARES Act rental elite, uh, assistance to uh, distribute on the islands, and they distributed $43 million uh, in uh, CARES Act funding in three months. So that it impacts and shows you what the need was. Now, recently, they, like I said, we keep fighting here. Uh, Catholic Charities of Hawaii received $6 million from the state with some new restrictions and caps. But listen, if $43 million went out into the economy in three months, $6 million is not going to be there too long. Next slide. So nonetheless, at CCUSA and our member agencies, and with you, we're always looking for solutions. And because there is a problem, we just don't, we don't throw up our hands. What did we do? So look at solutions in terms of short and long term. In the short term, we supported extending eviction moratoriums. Uh, we pulled our community of practice together to share best practices and to share things that uh, member agencies could learn from each other. Uh, CCUSA, through their social, poli uh, social policy colleagues, advise member agencies on federal rules and how to access some of these COVID and CARES Act related resources. And under the leadership of our C president and CEO, Sister Donna Markham, who uh, established uh, the Francis Fund, Rental Assistance Fund with the Felician Sisters, we were able to help out our uh, members with small uh, grants to, to help them with rental assistance. In the long term, it's advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. More affordable housing, we advocate for more funding for emergency uh, housing assistance, both rental and foreclosure, housing counseling, project development, preservation, et cetera. Next slide. So let's talk about the impacts of COVID on property management. And this is really directed uh, or, or coming from our member agencies that maintain uh, 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 portfolios of affordable housing. And of course, uh, several agencies reported information uh, to me about the impacts, particularly at the height of the pandemic, when one reported that all we did was emergency work orders during the height of the pandemic. And I get that to reduce exposure. And But the challenge with that is when you delay, when you only do emergency work orders, you delay routine or scheduled maintenance work. And the analogy I'll bring is sort of like uh, seeing your change oil light button come on your car, and, and but you, you continue to drive and drive and say, I'll get to it later, I'll get to it later. Finally, you have a major uh, breakdown and that costs you much more than that oil change. So we'll yet to see, we're, we're waiting to see what happens with those uh, delayed scheduled maintenance. And also one really thing I, I wanna point out to uh, my uh, former, uh, uh, workplace in Camden. 
one of the things they did, which I thought was really neat, was that they reduced uh, hours of uh, not just the maintenance staff, but all the staff to uh, five hours a day to lessen exposure of the staff and the residents, but they still maintained uh, their uh, staff's pay at 40 hours. So that was kind of their own uh, paycheck protection program. Next slide. And on the administration, it was just as difficult as property manager. Property managers can only process and lease uh, units and, and other duties by telephone, email, or regular mail. And what that does is that creates delay sometimes. If somebody forgot a form or forgot to ask a question or something of that nature with no more person-to-person, -person, in-person contact, so now a, a unit that could have gotten leased uh, you know, a week earlier and that, and that makes a difference for the tenant to get that affordable unit and also for the, uh, the property that, do, that relies on rent payments to, to uh, operate the business. And I think another thing I'd point out is that uh, one of the things that came uh, clear during the COVID impacts was the uh, internet access for some of the tenants. COVID protocols required us to close certain buildings in the, uh, in the properties, public spaces and computer labs were not immune. And with that, some, some, some residents did not have internet access so staff had to work to, to, to try to relieve that problem. Next slide. So the solutions that uh, we talked about on property management and Jane already talked about how uh, CCUS, uh, CCUSA helps secure donations of uh, personal protective equipment, sanitizer, disinfectants. We did the same thing for our properties and it really helped them because number one, some of them couldn't find it, couldn't get access to it. We were able to help with that. And number two, it reduced the pressure on their budgets that were already strained with the, the COVID uh, and the pandemic. They also uh, made generous repayment agreements and uh, work with their residents that may have had uh, issues because if you'll understand affordable housing, not every affordable housing project has rental assistance. Uh, tax credit projects are a great example. And if somebody loses a job, they still need to pay the rent. And in the long term, I hope uh, you consider advocating for you know, this, this problem with internet connections for low-income residents everywhere. I mean, that, that even helps with health and, and work with my colleagues in integrated health just to uh, make available something like telehealth for uh, the residents, particularly the seniors. Next slide, please. So finally, we're gonna have a conversation about project uh, production. And uh, our, our member agency, uh, our housing, community practice member in San Jose, uh, they were hurt by COVID with construction delays. Again, protocols slowed down municipal inspections or uh, you know, construction inspections. Yet when your project is delayed by 30 or 60 or even 90 days, uh, construction loan interest payments continue to accrue. And you try to renegotiate that, but that, that's, a, that's a challenge. They also uh, endured uh, investors who became a little skittish because of the pandemic and wanted to renegotiate tax credit investments and, and loan interest. Next slide. Another member agency in Philadelphia suffered nearly a million dollar project price increase trying to close on a, a senior housing construction financing in March, 2020, just when this thing was really taking off. And so you can see uh, they have to cut back here and use different materials there to, to get their project financing and fit within these uh, spikes. Same thing again happened in uh, our member agency in Phoenix who uh, had a project ready to go that uh, suddenly was hit with uh, escalations in lumber costs. And this other project where typically uh, they attract six or seven uh, uh, tax credit investors this time in mid 2020, they had won. So thank God for that one so they could do their project, but there's no negotiation in there. Next slide. So here are some of the project production solutions. Certainly CCUSA has worked to uh, develop loan funds for gap financing and trying to and bridge financing to try to get projects over the hurdle. 
Uh, we certainly encourage where possible for our member agencies to look at surplus church property if available as an option. Our healthy housing initiative, we think helps within some of this production solutions, uh, not only uh, in production, in terms of production, but also in terms of homeless prevention. In the long term, I bring you back to advocacy and you'll see there's a running theme that means your advocacy not only has to you know, remain, but it needs to be consistent. And the reason I point to that is because a recent victory that uh, housers had with the 4% low income housing tax credits getting a floor, and that made a big difference on attracting uh, additional subsidy projects. Now that took maybe four or five years of uh, battling it and, and advocacy and fighting for it, but we stayed with it. So that's going to help. Um, and the other suggestions I'd say is let's, let's talk to your legislators about set aside from faith based providers who are in this for the long haul and additional affordable housing. Next slide, please. Just a quick uh, mention of our Healthy Housing Initiative, which was launched in um, January of 2020. It's a, an integrated model that combines the health and uh, primary care expertise of Catholic Health with the social service and housing and integrated health behavioral health services of Catholic Charities to really come together and attack what is one of the most challenging cohorts of um, mm -hmm. homelessness, and that's the chronically homeless. Those have been uh, without shelter or uh, in inhabitable situations for over a 12 month period, consecutive period. Next slide. And so we started this uh, pilot in January 20th, as I said, our model agency was Spokane, Washington, and the other pilot cities are Detroit, Las Vegas, Portland, and St. Louis. And over the five year period, the goals of the Healthy Housing Initiative pilot are to reduce chronic homelessness by 20%, to decrease hospital readmission rates by 25%, and to connect 35% of those housed with primary and behavioral health providers. So that's our goals. And you can see we continue to try to look for solutions both on the production and the homeless prevention side. Next slide. So let's. Let's, let's start to finish up with some policy uh, needs and uh, things that you're going to the Hill about. And um, again, I go with short term and long term. Right now, there's a, the pandemic's upon us and there are some urgent needs and, 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 and Catholic Charities is, is leading the way and trying to forestall this eviction tsunami. So we need right now 100 billion in emergency rental assistance. Uh, we just got 25 billion in the last COVID package, but that's not going to be nearly enough to, to deal with uh, what we're facing. You heard that Catholic Charities in Hawaii did 43 million in three months. So we also need a national uniform eviction moratorium to, to, to just to clear up some of this confusion. I'd point out to you that uh, 11 billion in homeless assistance and at least another half a million housing choice vouchers, which is rental assistance, would really start to stabilize uh, the country's economy and affordable housing. Next slide. So in the long term, I ask you to think of three things. And I'll just say them is this way, bridging the gap, expanding the stock, and stabilizing households. We're talking bridging the gap between rents and income for the most vulnerable. And that would work just using a, a, a existing program, the Housing Choice Voucher Rental Assistance Program. Just need significantly more of those. Expanding the stock. Um, here we're talking about affordable housing uh, production units. We need those. The National Housing Trust Fund is a, a good vehicle to do that. And the best part is that it's largely funded by um, Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac, two government-sponsored enterprises that uh, their fees go into the trust fund. And this could spark other projects along with that 4% tax credit victory we just experienced. And finally, stabilize households. 
And this kind of points to an overall arching uh, uh, position where we're talking about an emergency assistance fund where anybody can have an emergency. Anyone can lose their job. Um, anyone can um, have a medical emergency. I think Jane will attest to that. Um, many of the our member agencies saw people they never saw before. And so that would be, um, you know, just an example of how a small assistance could uh, buy someone some time to prevent from going over into uh, uh, an addiction crisis or a homeless situation. Next slide. So finally, I'll leave you with this. I call this things you can do at home. Number one, I call this leverage your local voter constituency. What do I mean by that? Well, I hear from my colleagues in social uh, policy that it's, it's Catholic Charities USA can come up with uh, wonderful data and make policy papers and, 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 and su uh, support the position to publicize your work. But at the end of the day, the legislators hear from their constituencies whose voice is much louder because you vote for them. We don't, you do. So stay connected. Let them know that the affordable housing is important to you on the local and the national level, and let them know that they'll hear from you often. Support your local Catholic charities if they have an affordable housing portfolio, especially if they have a housing portfolio. Support them anyway. But you might want to see if your diocese has surplus church property, and that could be a closed school or some land or a bequest. Uh, whatever it is that might be uh, a possible project for affordable housing. And finally, support local projects, affordable housing projects uh, with community engagement and community support. I mean, show up at a zoning board meeting and uh, say we need this. So thank you for listening and uh, have a great day. Thank you both of you for your time and your expertise. You've certainly given our advocates a lot to think about and you've presented some of the challenges and opportunities in providing these services. And um, now I think they've got a lot of information to bring their voices to Capitol Hill. So thank you. And we really look forward to talking with you more during CSMG and having you answer some questions. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.